We're joined today by Dr. Buzz Aldrin. Dr. Aldrin, thank you for joining us. First question, where did the name Buzz come from, the nickname Buzz? Uh, well, I was a junior, Edwin Eugene Aldrin, Jr., and uh, uh, the nickname Eddie was used for my father by the Air Corps, and uh, my mother didn't like that, so she called him Gene. So the two nicknames uh, were gone, and I had two older sisters, so I was referred to as their uh, brother, but they couldn't pronounce that. It came out Buzzer. So for uh, the first five years, I guess, of my life, I was Buzzer, and then I became Buzz. And everybody just called me that. Uh, so uh, I waited a while. And uh, you know, he, he, when I would get into something, pretty soon everyone would call me Buzz, and nobody would call me uh, Edwin or anything like that. So after my father died, I decided to just legalize and uh, change my name uh, in court legally. So it's that way at my passport and uh, driver's license. No middle initial, just Buzz Aldrin. Well, it seems to fit you anyway, huh? Well, I hope so. <laughs> uh, what Disney, was Disney and Pixar seem to think so, yeah. What was your childhood like? Um, well, I grew up in upper middle class. My father was uh, an early aviation pioneer, and he was in the Air Corps. Uh, and then in 1928, uh, he went into the reserve to work for Standard Oil of New Jersey, and I'm sure they gave him some stock uh, incentive benefits uh, during that uh, build-up period of economy. Uh, but then uh, in 1929, he uh, cashed in a number of those to buy a house in Montclair, New Jersey, just before the, the stock market crash. So uh, we, we grew up uh, in Montclair, New Jersey, in an upper middle class uh, uh, environment, and it was comfortable. It was a wonderful suburban town to grow up and have friends up and down the street. And then I went away to summer camp uh, in Maine starting when I was uh, nine years old and I continued to go there for uh, two months uh, of every summer until I was uh, 16 and, and that really taught me a lot about competitiveness and teamwork and camaraderie and uh, uh, I give a lot of credit to uh, to that particular summer camp in Maine for developing the athletic uh, comp competitiveness. Competitiveness a big part of your life? Well um, I guess so. Probably more in individual. I, uh, uh, I learned to pole vault by, uh, uh, well, maybe imitating some people. And then I left it alone for a while until I uh, was almost in high school. And uh, then I took it up again and uh, did quite well. Uh, so uh, I uh, continued that uh, through West Point. And this is before the time when the poles bent 90 degrees and became a gymnastic event. Um, but it was an individual sport, uh, more than, than a team one. Uh, I, I was reasonably well coordinated, so I was on uh, the football team. Uh, but I uh, deferred from the team my junior year in high school to prepare for uh, academics to get into West Point. And uh, when they uh, played the first game that fall, I, I was very sorry that I had done that because I wanted to be a part of that. So in my senior year, uh, all the backfield positions were, uh, were taken. So I was a 168-pound center uh, on an undefeated, untied state champion football team at the, the highest level. Uh, we, we, were, uh, we were an outstanding uh, group of uh, competitors. Where did the interest in rocketry come from? Well, the interest in rocketry uh, it didn't come when I was at West Point. I had a classmate who was quite interested. His father was a general, and uh, he was very smart. Uh, we, we were near the top of the class, but he was fascinated with rockets uh, from the Army perspective. Uh, and we visited Fort Bliss during, the, during one of the summer times, and somehow I, I just didn't see that uh, as being competitive with the Air Force flying airplanes and fighters and. So when I graduated from West Point uh, in 1951, uh, third in my class, I uh, went into the Air Force and went through pilot training uh, and graduated uh, in, in Texas, went through Las Vegas gunnery training and was involved in uh, the Korean War for the last six months uh, in uh, 1953 of the Korean War. You flew a couple, uh, more than 60 missions in Korea, didn't you? Yes, 66 missions. Uh, when I first got over to Korea, 
you know, this is reflecting back. Um, there was a, a captain from the Marines who was in a neighboring squadron, uh, John Glenn. He was flying his second tour of combat. Uh, first tour was in the Navy Panther jets, and now he was going to be able to fly the Air Force uh, F-86. So near the end of the war, why I think he uh, uh, eventually was credited uh, with shooting down three bigs, and, uh, and I happened to get into a fortunate position twice and shot down uh, two bigs. What is the feeling when you're in combat like that? It's uh, a great uncertainty. Uh, you hope that uh, your wingman is doing his job because you're concentrating very much on, uh, on the task in front of you of, of lining up uh, your gun sight and making the intercept uh, and then uh, uh, watching to see how, how well your gunnery is. Uh, so the, the first kill was a, was a very gentle one and it made uh, Life Magazine Picture of the Week because it was the first time gun camera film had ever uh, taken a picture of the canopy coming off and then the, the fire of the ejection seat uh, and seeing the, the, the pilot uh, being ejected from the, uh, the big 15. The second one, uh, uh, I didn't have a wingman. Uh, I, I was in a uh, quite, quite a gaggle uh, on a, an important mission where they were uh, bombing uh, uh, right close to the dam on the, on the Yalu River and uh, the, the MiGs were stirring around a good bit and uh, uh, I happened to find myself in a position uh, of still trying to catch up with the number three man and uh, a MiG uh, got in front of me and uh, we went back and forth and uh, uh, that gives you a feeling of uh, great concern when you don't know who might be behind you. You can't take your eye off the task of uh, the, the competitiveness with the person in front of you to, to look back behind, you just hope for the best. And it turned out that there wasn't anybody behind me. Now at that point in your life, in your career, was that what you were aiming to do or, or where did you have your sights set at that point? Well, I was very satisfied with uh, the way that uh, the 23-year-old uh, turned out to uh, embark on the beginning of his career as a second lieutenant. And from Korea, I went back uh, and instructed in gunnery. Um, you know, a, a lot of people ask about space flight. Uh, if we're uh, afraid or scared or fearful, it's no comparison to being in combat where everything is unknown. Uh, how things are going to unfold, uh, what he's going to do, what you're going to do, all of those things are uh, uh, not according to any particular plan. And he's out to get you and things are happening in a hurry. In space flight, uh, except during the launch, uh, usually things are happening quite slowly and uh, there's uh, so much attention that's been paid to exercising over and over again all of the normal procedures and then concentrating on as many of the emergency procedures as you possibly can. So you feel quite confident that you know what to do in space flight and there isn't a concern for having a clouded mind that fear brings on. And that would serve you well later. I understand that uh, Apollo 11, when that lifted off, your heartbeat was below normal? Well, I wasn't watching. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, was, <laughs> uh, it was probably uh, peaceful, let me put it that way. Uh, relieved that we were on our way. Talk about your MIT career to a certain extent. What was the degree you got? Um, do they still even offer that sort of degree, mm -hmm. that postgraduate degree, and that sort of thing? Well, um, when, when I uh, left the Air Force Academy where I was uh, aide to the dean of faculty and uh, got an assignment over to Germany to fly F-100s in 1956, when I got over there, a good friend of mine from West Point on the track team, Ed White, was over there. And uh, he had been there about a year and a half or two years, so he talked me into getting into this one squadron that had a very good spirit to it, the uh, 22nd Squadron. Uh, and uh, we flew F-100s there. Ed and I represented our squadron on a NATO gunnery competition. Then he rotated back about a year and a half or two years before I did. And he went to Michigan 
uh, for a two-year master's program, and then he wrote me that he was going to go through the test pilot school. So when it came time for me to go back, it, uh, it seemed appropriate in that part of my career, with about eight years of service, to uh, go back to MIT, where my father had gotten his doctor's degree. So I uh, selected that as my next assignment, and when I got there, um, maybe six months after uh, I was involved in uh, getting settled into the, um, uh, the math and calculus and differential equations, uh, I was doing well enough that I felt that I could extend my program for a doctor's degree. Now, this is in 1960 and 61. And uh, of course, uh, 61 in April was when Yuri Gagarin made his first flight, uh, April 12th, and then Alan Shepard, May 5th, 1961. By this time, I had already selected uh, my thesis being rendezvous in space. I uh, felt I knew how to uh, intercept airplanes um, in the atmosphere, and I was intrigued with the uh, potential and the, the necessity for bringing things together uh, with human <coughs> involvement in space. So uh, with the target in orbit, uh, I wanted to come up with ways where you could uh, step by step so that the pilot, the astronaut, could understand what he was doing. So I wrote my thesis on line of sight guidance techniques <coughs> Excuse me. for manned orbital rendezvous. And, uh, and I look back on that and, and uh, look back on the year 1961 and 62. You know, it wasn't until uh, February of 1962 that John Glenn uh, was the first American to orbit the Earth. Um, and by that time, I was well into writing, writing my thesis. And uh, that particular subject has uh, uh, been very satisfying. I, I can hardly believe that I had the, the insight or the wisdom or whatever you might call it to have selected that subject because uh, eventually I was able to use those techniques that I learned there to uh, modify, help suggest to NASA the modifications that they could make in the rendezvous procedures for the Gemini program. And those went so well in the Gemini program that Apollo changed its procedures somewhat. And uh, the essence of what I had uh, worked on in my thesis became how we uh, had the astronaut understand better what was happening so that he could make calculations and rough uh, measurements uh, to back up the computer or the radar uh, if, if they failed during uh, the mission. And of course, this is very critical because we made the decision in uh, 1961 to uh, use the strategy at the moon of lunar orbit rendezvous. So two spacecraft went to the moon, one landed, and then it had to lift off and rendezvous with the other spacecraft around the moon uh, with not all that much assistance from, from Earth. The tracking from Earth is phenomenally uh, accurate, and of course it was uh, uh, very, very useful for all of the maneuvers, and it got us in good position to make a, a landing. Um, uh, of course, we'll never forget that uh, first, first landing. Uh, we were a heavier than normal spacecraft, because it was an early spacecraft. so. Uh, uh, and, and we had uh, computer alarms during the descent, which caused uh, uh, a distraction from where we were heading. And uh, when Neil took over manually at about 500 feet and maneuvered around uh, some, uh, a crater that had some rocks in it and selected a place to land, by the time we were about 100 feet, we were down to 60 seconds of fuel left, and it was getting pretty close. Uh, fortunately, at 30 seconds, we were a little bit more than 10 feet maybe, but we touched down with maybe about 15 seconds of fuel left. So the work that you did in MIT really bared, bore fruit? Well, not only in, uh, in, in helping uh, formulate the, the basic approach to rendezvous in the Gemini and Apollo program, where one would wait until you got into a position and then you would make an intercept that was near standard or as close to standard as possible so that you could then expect things to happen in a certain sequence. Um, that has been used uh, pretty much uh, since then. 
But what it also gave me was a sense of understanding of the relative motion of two objects as they're going around together in orbit. And uh, uh, I've moved from orbits around the Earth or around the Moon to now uh, using that uh, gut feeling, that seat of the pants approach, to look at orbits between Earth and Mars, orbits, cycling orbits that go around the Sun and swing by the Earth with gravity assist that then uh, results in a swing by of Mars and comes back to Earth again. So uh, it, it's been very helpful in my formulating what I believe is the best strategy for going uh, to Mars with human beings. Uh, and I hope that'll happen in about 20 years. Let me take a step back for a second. Talk to me, if you will, a little bit about the early days of the space program. You had mentioned in one of your books that Kennedy coming out and saying that we'll have a man on the moon by the end of this decade was the height of chutzpah. What was it like? What was the excitement like? What was the feeling like? What was the energy like during those days? Well, when that happened in uh, May 25th of 1961, when Kennedy made that speech, um, I was uh, at MIT. And uh, I forget exactly where the circumstances were when I heard about that. Um, but uh, I, I was underway in my uh, doctoral thesis at that point, and it wasn't until the beginnings of uh, 1963 that I uh, left MIT. I came back in, the, uh, in June of 1963 to receive my degree, but, but I was uh, at that time uh, stationed in uh, Los Angeles with the uh, Space Division, eventually moving to Houston to work in the Air Force Experiments Office supporting the Gemini program. And it was there in the fall of 1963 that I was uh, notified that I was selected to be in the third group of astronauts. Did you think that it was doable, that we could reach the moon by the end of the 1960s? I had no uh, reason to think otherwise. Uh, there just was not a wealth of experience in how well a nation could pioneer in, in such a new venture as getting spacecraft into orbit, getting the people back down again in, uh, in uh, fairly accurate uh, landings as we return back to Earth, uh, long duration flights, spacewalking. We, we had some problems initially in spacewalking and I came along at just the right time to be able to uh, train underwater in neutral buoyancy uh, for my uh, Gemini 12 flight. And by that time, we also had improved the foot restraints. So uh, space walking became much easier to demonstrate that we knew what we were doing by the time we got to the end of the Gemini program. My, my regret was that uh, the Air Force maneuvering backpack had been canceled uh, by NASA on that last mission um, and I feel that I certainly could have uh, done a very credible job uh, making use of that maneuvering unit in 1966, uh, in November 1966. It wasn't until uh, in the mid-80s with the space shuttle that we actually exercised a backpack maneuvering unit. Uh, I think they had one inside the Skylab flight, but it wasn't uh, outside in space until uh, parts of the shuttle program. Was NASA necessary, do you think, or could the Air Force or the military have done just as good, if not better, job? Well, that's a high-level position for, uh, for a captain or a major uh, uh, that I was at that time. Um, I, I, I think it was a smart move to uh, expand NACA into the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and to give them the open program of uh, proceeding with the challenge that uh, President Kennedy uh, set for us of going to the moon. Um, of course, it was already uh, NASA by that time. Um, but uh, I, I think that was a wise choice. Uh, the, the Air Force, um, in, in its missions of potentially making use of man in space or humans in space, seemed to uh, 
to vacillate back and forth. At first there was a dinosaur program that was uh, to be launched on top of a Titan and that competed a little bit with the, with the Gemini program so the dinosaur program was canceled and then part of the studies that I was involved in uh, was to see whether the Air Force might want to fly uh, the last two missions or another additional two missions at the end of the Gemini program, but the Air Force decided not to do that. And then there was the manned orbiting laboratory where a modification of Gemini was, was being considered and they actually selected uh, manned orbiting laboratory astronauts and trained them for a period of time and then that program was canceled. Then we got into the space shuttle uh, and it looked like the Air Force was going to be involved in that. There was a manned space flight engineer program, and then that was set aside. So there was, th there was this on and off and on and off, and, uh, and I think the Air Force is, is still uh, trying to determine exactly where the human fits into the missions that the Air Force sees in the future. And, and I think there will be uh, room for uh, manned spaceflight activities with some of the uh, missions of the future, uh, orbiting space-based uh, lasers, uh, space planes. Uh, some of that, of course, can be carried out uh, without uh, human crews, but then again, we, uh, we just might want to have uh, uh, military pilots involved in, in space plane activities at, at some point. And uh, of course, inspection and uh, servicing and repair of, of some of the uh, military assets uh, just may come along in the future as, as a very desirable thing. What was it like being an astronaut during the 1960s? You, you guys were really like rock and roll stars. Well, we didn't look at ourselves uh, quite as rock and roll. I uh, didn't have all that great appreciation uh, for, for that style of music, uh, I come to accept what what is in being, but but I kind of like the ballroom type uh, music of the 50s and uh, maybe the early 60s. Uh, well, we, I was in the third group of astronauts, and there was a distinct seniority between the first group that was selected uh, in 19. 59, the Mercury astronauts, and then it was uh, uh, three, almost four years later, when the second group of astronauts were selected, uh, and they were all test pilots. I applied for that group, but I wasn't a test pilot, so they couldn't select me, but uh, the, you didn't have to be a test pilot the next year for the third group of astronauts. So I came in uh, with two or three other people in our group of uh, 14. The second group had nine people in it. We had 14 uh, people in, in our group. And several of us were, were not test pilots. And there was uh, a distinct uh, view I sensed from the ones who were uh, uh, test pilots looking maybe down somewhat on those of us who were not test pilots. Uh, I chose a different career path. I put more emphasis on professional education. Uh, that's what my father had done, and that's what other people had done. Somehow, uh, with the uh, tour of combat in Korea and then the other assignments, it, it just didn't occur to me that I wanted my career to be dependent upon my coordinated skills as a pilot. I, I wanted it to be more relying on my professional knowledge and, uh, and creativity. And fortunately, I chose the route that I think uh, suited me fine, and the timing turned out to be just almost perfect. When I came along with that education and that experience to, uh, to, to get into the uh, astronaut program when I did. The only problem was that, the, for the most part, the people in the third group of astronauts were not commanders of flights. We were uh, the pilot or the second in command. Uh, except for some of the uh, people who had flown several times. And in the later, latter part of the Apollo program, some of our third group uh, did command flights. Was there a lot of jockeying around to be on the first mission to the moon? A lot of jockeying around with the astronauts themselves? 
Well, there was a lot of um, wondering. I, I wouldn't really call it jockeying around. Uh, I, I'm sure that some people felt they had uh, better access to the selection process that was pretty much determined by uh, the two people in the Mercury program, uh, Alan Shepard uh, in, in charge of the astronaut office as the chief astronaut office, and uh, Deke Slayton, who was grounded, and he was in charge of flight crew operations. So th those two people essentially uh, selected uh, the sequence of crews. Now, once, once that sequence was selected, there wasn't m too much opportunity for, for changing around. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, those of us in the third group uh, we were going to be flying with someone in the second group, so we were going to be the junior person. And uh, my first space flight, <coughs> I, I went from the backup crew with Jim Lovell uh, because of a tragic airplane accident. We ended up backing up uh, Gemini 9, and then we flew together and the prime crew of Gemini 12. And uh, when we got into the Apollo program, uh, uh, Neil, Armstrong and Jim Lovell and I were originally back up to the third Apollo flight. Uh, Jim was advanced uh, to the prime crew and the mission was switched to the second Apollo mission, which became Apollo 8, and its mission without a lander became the first uh, flight to orbit around the moon 10 times during December of 1968. It was really uh, a very challenging and very intriguing mission to be on the backup crew, uh, or to be any part of that, because it was the first mission that was going to leave the Earth and, uh, and reach the moon. Uh, it was, uh, to a large degree, a test of the navigation that uh, the onboard navigator, in this case Jim Lovell, I was his backup, uh, how well could we navigate in the event that the deep space tracking network uh, was not able to give us the uh, tracking that we felt they, they certainly could. If, if we lost communications, then we would have to navigate with the sextant. And it was very tedious making many, many measurements between of the angle between star and uh, moon horizon or the star and uh, earth horizon to then feed that into the computer and to have it give you a safe return to earth uh, trajectory. Tell us what it was like when you found out you were selected, you were going to the moon. Well, being on the backup crew for Apollo 8, the first flight that went to the moon, while that flight was uh, underway in December of 68, there already was a prime and backup crew for Apollo 9 and Apollo 10. Apollo 9 would test the lunar lander in Earth orbit and if that was successful, then Apollo 10 would do a dress rehearsal, testing the lander, uh, doing everything except the landing in lunar orbit. So we knew that if uh, the sequence went as it previously did, that we would be in position to uh, be on the crew of Apollo 11, going from the backup crew of eight to the primary crew of uh, Apollo 11. And uh, in January, it was announced that uh, um, that was the case. What was your feeling? Well, there's uh, one of sort of great relief that, that the selection f formality was made, but now there's great uncertainty of, of training for that mission, uh, anticipating, of course, the success of the major portions of the next two flights. And as they unfolded successfully, we got closer and closer to realizing that indeed we would be given the opportunity, a very, very fortunate opportunity, to make the first uh, human landing on the moon. Any self-doubts? I don't think there were self-doubts. There was a, a self-challenge to be as businesslike, as dedicated to doing the very best that we possibly could. To, to understanding the training, understanding what was needed, preparing ourselves in the different simulations uh, to be able to respond correctly to the normal procedures and uh, to any emergencies that might come up. So you were well rehearsed then? Uh, 
I think we were reasonably well rehearsed. I say reasonably, you could always keep training and training and training and uh, be uh, a little bit sharper. Uh, we did have a deadline. Uh, I guess it was maybe three weeks before uh, we before our launch in July of 1969. Maybe it's less than that. We were asked if we felt we needed another month of training so that we could go in August. And we felt we were reasonably ready to be able to uh, take on the mission as uh, scheduled. Uh, at the time, we weren't real sure why we were asked that question. I'm pretty sure it had to do with the fact that, that the Russian uh, rocket had, uh, uh, had an unsuccessful launch, uh, not maybe two weeks before. I think it was er very early in July that their N-1 rocket uh, uh, was on a test flight quite uh, assuredly an unmanned flight, but it uh, didn't make it into space. And so that gave us a little more breathing room. <clears throat> but uh, if we went in July and uh, were not able to successfully land, then there were at least two more opportunities before the end of uh, 1969. And when we did succeed in landing, then they uh, delayed Apollo 12 from uh, September or October until a November launch, I think it was. And uh, they were successful, of course, also. What was the training regimen like? What was a typical day for an astronaut on that, that mission? I don't think there was a, a, a typical day uh, of training. Uh, we, we knew what we were going to be doing. We, we would uh, be in a simulator uh, working the uh, computer. And at the same time, we were designing the, the patch insignia and uh, we, I remember one day we went into the command module to do some uh, computer activities and we asked the crew that were, of instructors that were training us. We said, what do you think of this uh, uh, Apollo 11 insignia of the eagle uh, about to land on the moon? And the, one of the instructors said, well, why don't you have the eagle carry an olive branch? Well, that, that really made the big difference, and, and that made me feel so much more uh, satisfied that we had selected such a symbolic uh, patch for Apollo 11 uh, carrying the olive branch of peace, because uh, we already knew that uh, uh, this was an open program, and, and we were doing this uh, in a complete view of the rest of the world. And as a matter of fact, the plaque on the moon stated that we came in peace for all mankind. And so the olive branch was a very appropriate symbol. What was it like the night before you left? Uh, I don't think uh, anyone slept all that well the night before. Uh, uh, you know, you have a big day ahead of you, and uh, you've, been, uh, you've been training and, and resting, and you probably uh, are not all that tired. You're sort of keyed up. Uh, but we, we slept a certain amount, and then we got up and went through the various processes. We had plenty of time. Um, I, I remember that uh, somehow I lost a ring that I wanted to carry with me, uh, so I delayed uh, putting the gloves on till the very last minute, and somebody found the ring that uh, had come off, and I wiped my hands, and uh, so I, right at the last minute, I was able to put that ring on. Uh, uh, before we had to suit up completely and put the gloves on to, to get in the van and go out to the uh, launch pad. Did you talk to your parents, particularly your father, the night before or the day before? Did he give you any advice? Um, well, I felt my father probably would have given me advice, uh, but, but I wasn't sure that he really understood uh, all the details of what we were going through. So uh, rather than maybe put him on the spot, uh, uh, best I can recall, we just went about our activities. We had a chance to, to talk to our families the night before, uh, of course. But once we got up in the morning, it was a uh, uh, pretty serious business. Now, as I understand, the President Nixon had drafted a response in case the mission did not go well and the three of you did not come back. Did you know that beforehand? No, we 
we didn't, but uh, when that news came out uh, sometime within the last year, I think maybe it was around the 30th anniversary of our landing that uh, someone finally uncovered uh, that from the archives, it was not at all surprising. Uh, I would expect uh, a, a leader of a nation about to do something like that would have his staff prepare him for the various eventualities. Uh, of course, we all remember that uh, Eisenhower prepared some remarks. Uh, probably he prepared it himself before D-Day in the event that uh, it didn't work out the way he had hoped. Uh, so it's not surprising that, uh, that people in uh, uh, positions of great responsibility and authority uh, rely on their staff uh, to, to assist them in preparing appropriate remarks rather than one individual having to come up with a response to, uh, to either a great success or to a tragedy. Take us through that day a little bit. Take us through everything from, from that morning to getting into, the, into Apollo 11 to the liftoff. Take us through what all of that was like. You have a perspective that almost nobody else does and for the billions of people who haven't been there who haven't gone through this it, it's it's kind of a mystery it's an amazing mystery and we're looking for some sort of some sort of insight into what that was all like well a, a few things stand out we, we got up in the morning and uh, got s had breakfast with the backup crew and before we went in to get suited up uh, we did have a few words with uh, the administrator of NASA at that time, uh, Tom Payne. Uh, I, uh, since that, after that time, I, I grew to really admire him tremendously because uh, after I left NASA, I worked very closely with him in Southern California. But, but he got us aside and said, now, now I want you to be very, very careful and uh, don't take any unnecessary risks in this uh, flight of yours to land on the moon, and if, if it just doesn't seem right, uh, why well, come on back and I'll see that you're put on the next mission. Well, <laughs> uh, that was a, a, a very reassuring thing for him to say, uh, but I doubt very much if that would have set too well uh, uh, with the crew that was assigned to the next mission that was ready to go uh, and make the first landing. But it, but it was certainly a, a reassuring thing to us. Uh, I'm not sure that it went through my mind or, that, or through Neil's mind as we got closer and closer that, uh, that if we decided we didn't have enough fuel to land and went on back, that that's okay, we'll be on the next mission. <laughs> How was it finally decided who the first person to walk on the moon was going to be? Was that a NASA decision? Did you guys figure that out among yourselves, or how was that decided? It certainly wasn't uh, left up to us. Uh, it, it's rather a long story, but before crews were selected, uh, there were various uh, timelines laid out by different people. I know Jack Schmidt and I worked on some timelines, and uh, at that time, I'm not sure exactly what it was, but the, but one thing I wanted to have into the flight plan was as soon as we landed that we would go through a preparation for launch the next time that the command module came over or, or two hours later. It had been five days at least uh, since one had uh, gone through the training for a very critical liftoff and rendezvous and that the first thing on the moon probably was to get settled and to then go through the countdown as if you might actually have to lift off if there were any leaks or anything and uh, after touchdown. Uh, things of that nature were, were outlined in procedures before crews were actually selected. And uh, th there was um, a, a history of uh, space walking that set somewhat of a precedent in all of the spacewalking uh, activities in the Gemini program and in Apollo. It was not the commander who did the spacewalk, but it was uh, the junior person. Even on Apollo 9, uh, the commander uh, of the mission uh, 
did not do the spacewalks. The other two people did, the, the lunar module pilot and the command module pilot uh, were the ones who, who demonstrated some of the emergency procedures. So, so there were precedents that would lead one to think that the very uh, severe training workload required of the commander for the launch from the surface of the Earth, for the en route decisions, for the landing itself, and then the liftoff from the moon were, were all uh, very intense uh, requirements for training that only the commander uh, went through in, in great detail. So to then have him be the person who was doing more activities on the surface, uh, th there was an argument that said it might, might be better to have the, the junior person do more of the activities out on the surface. A decision was not being made because of the different uh, factions that you can imagine uh, was going on within the astronaut group, uh, commanders and the uh, lunar module pilots, uh, but the, a decision was not made uh, until rather late. So uh, I felt that we needed a decision, and uh, it was not forthcoming. So uh, I, I asked the head of the Apollo program office if we could have a decision soon, and to make sure that if we made a decision that it would not be changed at all. And uh, that was maybe five or six weeks, I think, before launch. And we did have a decision. And uh, in retrospect, it was very clear that uh, it was the way that it should have been decided because of the great emphasis that the public and the press and the media put on the first person to do this is always uh, given such uh, great more attention. And it just would not have been appropriate for the commander to have stayed in the lunar module while the junior person uh, went out and did, did this great symbolic things of uh, stepping out onto the lunar surface first. But we didn't really know those things. And, uh, and, uh, and we were a very competitive group of people. And, uh, and I felt it was the natural thing to put forth the points of view that represented where I was coming from. And I did that. And, uh, some people didn't appreciate uh, uh, that coming from a, um, a fortunate, in the right place at the right time, academic egghead <laughs> with combat record, uh, but I wasn't a Navy carrier pilot. Uh, you know, there, there were lots of differences between uh, the, the astronauts, and it was a very competitive group of people. And some people were... Uh, uh, going to come out more favorable in the way that the selection process went. Not necessarily because of their talents, but because it just had to be a decision made. Somebody had to be picked one way or the other. What was it like, your first step on the moon? Uh, I don't, wouldn't want to say it was a letdown. Uh, I, I could very well see, looking from my window, that it was very easy for Neil to walk around and, and to scoop up a contingency sample. And then when I got down, it, uh, it was really as expected. It was easier to move around on the surface than I guess we had thought it would be. And it, and, uh, but still, we wanted to you know, exercise a, a thorough understanding of the mobility, the balance. And later during the, uh, the spacewalk, uh, in front of the TV camera, so that people back here, I, I uh, sort of jogged back and forth, uh, showing different mobility ways of two feet at a time, one in front of the other turning. And uh, I was having a good time, but, but I was really doing that for the benefit of people here to uh, get a very qualitative uh, indication of, of what the mobility was like and, and how easy it was to move. My seven-year-old wants to know, was it hard to walk around? Did you feel like you were tripping, or wasn't it difficult to walk on the moon? It was really very easy. The, uh, uh, the combination of the restricted mobility of the pressure suit, which would uh, keep your legs and arms from moving very rapidly, the combination of that restriction and the reduced gravity gave the overall impression of slow motion. 
whatever you were doing just was not going to happen as fast up there as it does down here. If you uh, lean a little bit, uh, you don't begin to lose your balance quickly at all. It's very, very slow, and it's very easy to recover. I read accounts from various astronauts that say if they, you weren't spiritual before you went up in space, you were afterwards. Did you feel the same way? Did you feel that there was an indication then that there, there is a God? Well, um, I felt it was appropriate to be, let's say, spiritually prepared as I uh, uh, went through training. Um, it, it was natural. I was an elder in the Presbyterian Church, and I felt there were maybe some things I could do. So I inquired and got permission to uh, serve myself communion when we were on the moon. Uh, because I felt this was uh, an indication of uh, uh, celebration or giving thanks. Uh, my ego uh, came out, and I wanted people to know what I was doing, because I felt good about it. Uh, but I was uh, advised not to uh, make mention of that uh, over the radio, and I understood that, and in retrospect, it was certainly the appropriate thing to do, uh, because uh, that was a rather secular thing. Um, since coming back from the moon, uh, I, I've been greatly impressed with how fortunate a few of us were to, to be a part of, of such a program. Um, but I don't think it has given me, uh, the trip at least, has given me any greater insight. Uh, I've had a growing, maturing appreciation of spirituality and perhaps a lessening of the individual religious uh, nature uh, that seems to attract uh, many, many humans. I, I think there's a much grander, much larger, bigger picture uh, Maybe it's an Einsteinian view of uh, spirituality. In one of your books, you mentioned that after it was all over with and you were in the decontamination process, you looked at Neil Armstrong and said, my God, Neil, we missed it all. You realized what a big event it was and the way the world had reacted. And, and you, I guess, had been so busy doing what you had been trained to do uh, that you felt like you had missed it in a way. Well. Um, that's not exactly what I uh, felt uh, the, the moment we got back onto the carrier, right after we'd gone through a physical exam and, uh, and uh, uh, taken a shower and so forth. We watched some film before the ceremonies on the carrier. We watched some uh, TV footage of the, the recordings uh, of the broadcasters when we landed safely on the moon, and we saw the reaction of people around the moon and around the Earth. Uh, in different parts, and, and that's when I uh, just felt the urge to say to Neil, look at that, we missed the whole thing. In, in a way, making a, a, a joke, but also making a, a, a serious observation, sort of a mixture of the two. Um, and and uh, I'm not sure exactly what prompted me to say that. Since then, I, I think what it was, was the realization that uh, the response that we were seeing around the world was a measure of the value of what we had just done, much more so than the rocks that we brought back or what anybody said or the questions that were answered. It was that for those brief moments, those minutes, those hours of the successful landing and then the, the, the walk on the moon, this was something that was shared worldwide in a way that could never again be repeated. And it did bring the world together. And they paused and they uh, forgot about other things that were happening for uh, a brief moment. And uh, the individuals, the humans around the world, treasure that moment as, as something that was meaningful in their lives. And for the most part, it is so etched in their memory that they remember where they were uh, during those moments. Let's talk about the last 30 years in the future of space also. I think it's most people's, the general public's imagination or mind set that the landing on the moon in 1969 was pretty much the epitome of the space program. 
and there hasn't been that much that's been notable since then. How do you dissuade them of that? Well, it certainly was the objective that we set forth. There was a competitiveness that started even before Sputnik. After Sputnik in 1957, it was uh, greatly uh, magnified. And, and then it became clear that, uh, that we were being challenged in achievements in the technology of rocketry and space flight by the Soviets. Uh, they had the first person to, to fly uh, in space. Uh, we couldn't uh, match that until uh, almost uh, uh, a year later. Uh, but by that time, we had uh, accepted the challenge that would spur together and, and make a commitment. So, so much of the, the 60s was involved in that competitiveness and that uh, measuring of how well we're proceeding toward our objective. And, and for that period of time, when one achieves that, then there is a sense of a letdown, maybe not with the participants who are going to go on the next flight and the next flight and then things go wrong in Apollo 13 and then we uh, have successful missions. But uh, for the public at large, there was uh, a significant distraction by the events going on in Southeast Asia and the differences of opinion of people um, about the appropriateness of the government's actions. And a uh, few people want to remember it, but I will remind them that right after we got out of quarantine, one of our first appearances was um, to receive the Pierre Marquette Discovery uh, Medal at uh, Marquette in uh, Wisconsin, I think it was. And, and when we were there, there were students demonstrating, and they chose that opportunity to throw eggs at us, having just come back from the moon. Now, that, that sounds like a very inappropriate thing, uh, but that was the sense of what was going on during those times. There was a great uh, division. Uh, when we flew the last uh, missions to the moon and, uh, and had underway already uh, something to do uh, with the Apollo equipment, the Apollo uh, rockets and spacecraft, while we were waiting for the development of the next major program, and that was pretty much set in motion in 1971, before the last uh, lunar mission. And that was the space shuttle. Uh, and the compromises that were involved in that were essentially put into, uh, into effect uh, by the end of 1961. The fact that we weren't going to have a two-stage fully reusable. Unfortunately, uh, they wanted to put a cockpit in the booster, and I couldn't understand why that was that way. And that two-stage fully reusable uh, became too expensive. So we went to the orbiter and the tank and, uh, and the solid rockets. But by that time, I uh, had left NASA. Uh, I didn't see some of the wisdom that was in that. And I still don't see the wisdom that was in uh, the cost savings by going with solid rockets. Uh, but what did happen was the uh, uh, what was called Apollo Applications, or the, the Earth Orbit Laboratory of a, of a solar laboratory in Skylab. Uh, and what I remark now, reflecting back on those days when I wasn't with NASA and didn't really appreciate it, uh, it took the, the space station defined in 1984 and then revised in many ways, uh, it was supposed to be ready in, within 10 years. And it uh, still isn't uh, complete and won't be until uh, after uh, 2004 or five or six. And it's uh, had to have been uh, reduced in capacity and, and uh, objectives quite a bit. And uh, uh, the cost has gone up considerably. So now I really appreciate what was done in Skylab with one launch of one big rocket that was very well tested. And we used the upper portion of that uh, to use a volume that was a converted uh, fuel tank. That became the pressure volume of the Skylab. And what put it into orbit was 
the second stage of the Saturn V, and when it got into orbit, there were very large hydrogen and oxygen tanks that were available, but we didn't need all that volume because there were only three people going to the space station. So we, we discarded that additional volume that was right there. Now, the next time we do something like that, which I believe we could and should do with the external tank and solid rockets without the orbiter but engines, we should launch the, the core stage of the tank with additional volumes on top of that and put that into orbit and then make use of the connected fuel tank of the external tank, the hydrogen tank, the oxygen tank, and two tanks above that. That should be the way we launch space stations of the future. As I see uh, the transportation that's needed in the future, there are two major pillars, two things that need to be developed. One of them is this shuttle-derived large volume that also, when we're not interested in a volume, then we have heavy payloads that we can't launch with any of the uh, expendable rockets of today. We need a much heavier rocket to send the cargo to the moon or the cargo to Mars or some of the Air Force uh, orbital space-based lasers or whatever they are. But we also need that same rocket to put up the volume that, that is existing in the tanks that go into orbit. So that's one pillar of the space transportation. And the other one is not high performance, but it is two-stage to orbit. A progression of these two-stage to orbit, we need a small, a medium, and a large. Here is an example of what I've been working on, which represents the medium-sized uh, reusable booster and upper stages. What is unique about our selection of this is that just like the jet airplanes of the early 50s, where the tail section would come off and you could take the jet engine out and put a new one in, an overhauled one in, put the airplane back together and fly it, why? Because the jet engines were not reliable, as they should be. They're much more reliable today. Rocket engines of today are not as reliable as they should be. Therefore, what we've done is to have the rocket separate from the airframe. This is an Atlas III rocket, very uh, lightweight, thin-skinned, and it's got a new ru Russian engine in it. So we put that in two airplanes. This is a dual booster, which increases the payload. Uh, we could use one of these with, uh, with a smaller rocket, or two of these with the smaller rocket, or this one can put about six tons into orbit. And of course, the, the, the booster separates, and it's unmanned, of course. This is just a booster, and these are existing uh, solid rockets and center rockets and, and uh, payload fairings. But this can put about six tons to geosynchronous transfer orbit, which is a very, very admirable payload. We have a, a bigger rocket that could be used uh, in, in the middle of this. Uh, and eventually, what we can do is, is to have uh, one of these boosters fly with an orbiter. Now that orbiter, in, in uh, in our way of thinking, should have hydrogen on the outside. This is a kerosene rocket in the booster, but it's a, a hydrogen rocket in the orbiter, the same shape, but the hydrogen is outside and the oxygen is, is inside. So uh, this separates at about Mach 5 or 6, and unmanned comes back with jet engines, flies back and lands, and this, of course, goes into orbit. It's uh, about half the size of, of the present orbiter, and it uh, delivers only crew to orbit. And of course, a, an interesting feature is that it has a crew module that separates so that the crew can be uh, safely aborted from this at any time uh, uh, during the uh, rocket launch. Implicit in all of this, though, is that NASA really can't do this. It has to be done through private industry now, and that's where the rub always comes well, in. It would be wonderful if NASA didn't have to do this, if private industry could do this and we could just say, they will do it. The fact of the matter is they won't do it because there's not 
uh, a payoff return. It has to be a government uh, pioneered in the, the development of it. We've, we've learned that now uh, when the single stage X33 has been canceled that there, there just is no way that industry is going to be able to get the investment money from Wall Street to do this. We will need to upgrade the present shuttle in a gradual evolutionary fashion and, and eventually have a larger version of this booster. This is a medium booster. A larger version of this would replace the uh, solid rocket boosters on the shuttle. And that larger version, using two of them on the present shuttle, would then use one booster with the orbiter, and that would replace the, uh, the crew and cargo uh, capacity of the present orbiter. And the civil version of that could now have crew and passengers, 60, 80, maybe 100, some number like that, that that allows an economical business to be made of the civil versions of what NASA needs to replace its present shuttle. So there's a partnership uh, needed in the development of a government need that also has spinoffs. Now, we've seen that happen before. Uh, back in the uh, early 50s, the Air Force had a B-47 and a B-52 jet bombers, but they just had a KC-97 propeller tanker. They needed a jet tanker to uh, refuel these jet bombers. But it was going to be expensive to develop that, but Boeing saw that if they could develop a tanker that also had the characteristics of being a civil jet liner. At that time, all of our airlines were flying propeller airplanes. Mm -hmm. It was not a jet airline business. But the KC-135 jet tanker was developed, and at the same time, the Boeing 707, the first uh, jet airliner. So there was a dual purpose of development of that, and, and that ushered in the jet age of uh, airline travel. That's what's needed, uh, a partnership, but we have to move there in, in incremental steps. So the two pillars of space transportation are large volume and heavy lift, uh, starting with the external tank and the solid rockets and eventually replacing the solid rockets with flyback boosters. But that's one pillar. The other is two-stage to orbit booster and orbiter. The question is, though, this will still take tens of billions of dollars of public money, and you have people who are screaming for more money for education, for the military, for military salaries, for eight million different reasons. Why is space travel, space exploration so important to the, to the public good that tens of billions of dollars spent on the, this is more valuable than tens of billions of dollars spent on education or health? There will always be the arguments that we could, instead of spending this on space, which we don't need, we could spend it back here. The fact of the matter is that the military does need to upgrade the ability to secure our assets in space. The U.S. has more satellites, and we have become more dependent upon satellites for our uh, security, our communication, worldwide security. Those assets need to be protected. We need to defend ourselves against uh, missile attacks. A number of these things have been sort of set aside. We need to catch up. These are the kinds of launch vehicles that is needed for the national security of our country. The competitiveness of our uh, delivery of the civilian rockets needs to be competitive with the increasing efficiencies of the French Ariane rockets. When this, the Challenger accident occurred, just before that, the U.S. launched about 90 percent of the Western world's payloads. After the Challenger accident, almost, almost three years later, that had decreased down to about 60 or 50 percent. Uh, it's still down around it, but the French have a new rocket that is uh, meeting its cost objectives. Uh, 
and, and we, on the contrast, have uh, expendable rockets that may not quite meet their cost objectives. We need to have uh, a, a, an active upgrading of the next generation system of rockets. Otherwise, uh, we will not be competitive in the world. Uh, now, the, the Chinese rockets are getting better and better, and of course the Russian rockets are very good, and they're based on a system that can reduce the cost down below what, what we can do. So we need to be competitive in that market. And I think we also uh, deserve to uh, the young people of our country to be leaders in the world of exploration and space. There's no reason why we can't have people return to the moon in 15 years about and and human explorers not tourists but explorers going to mars but only if we as a nation make a commitment that when we go to mars we're going to go there and not just do it two or three times and then stop but we're going to go to mars and have a gradual build up of a permanent presence of a settlement on mars sooner or later a responsible Civilization owes it to future generations to ensure the survival of humanity here on Earth. And you can never tell when something might come from outer space that we can't react against to prevent from a catastrophe happening here on Earth that could conceivably wipe out the human race unless we have a growing settlement somewhere. Now, whether that should be done uh, by 2025 or 2050 or 2100 or 2200 or just when it should be, I, I, I think it is a growing realization that uh, things can happen in this universe of ours that we don't have any control over. Whether we know whether there's life somewhere else or not, we owe it to our civilization to ensure its survival. So you really think the survival of humanity really depends on on space exploration? Continued? I think it eventually does, yes. Plus the opportunities for the resources that are in the asteroids to bring back to uh, make up for the depletion of the use of resources here on the surface of the Earth. And I think breakthroughs in energy uh, can, can make space travel much more uh, cost-effective and efficient. But the most important thing is we need to increase the reliability of the rockets that we have. One in 20 failure for expendable rockets is not very good. We, we need to make that one in 1,000, one in 10,000. And the best way to do that is to bring that rocket engine back after it's flown and look at it and examine it and find out where the failures are about to happen. And that means reusability. And we must break through this reusability barrier. We must be able to afford to invest in that. If the payload that is going into orbit is not uh, large enough, if we don't have a high enough volume then it's difficult to build the business case for investing in the wings and wheels to bring the rock. We might as well just throw them away if, if you look at it from that economic position. But if you have a vision for the future and you realize that in order to have an efficient system that's highly reliable, we have to have reusability, then uh, that, I mean, the one payload that gives us high volume traffic is people. And that's why I'm convinced that building a uh, delivery system and a place to go to, uh, a quarters in space, where people can go for about a week at a time, and a delivery system that can take uh, not 10 people once a month, but 50, 60, 80 people every other day. That's a lot of people, but that is what ballpark is needed to be able to charge people initially less than a million dollars and then closer and closer to a uh, hundred thousand dollars but still that's very expensive 
So 10 or 12 years ago, I realized we must do something else to broaden out the opportunities. And a lottery or a game show selection or some sponsorship, a method of selecting people other than how much money they have to invest in uh, a ride into space. We need something of that nature. Uh, when, when the rides are few and far between two or three a year, then we can have uh, a, an entertainment type selection or a sponsorship and, a, and an extensive training. But when we're flying people quite frequently, then we need something that, ha that has a, a rapid selection. And I think that's where we need to move into something like a sweepstakes or a lottery to uh, make it available to more than just those with great means. Do you have any qualms or any fears about the military use of space? I really don't. Um, I, I, I don't. I, I have qualms about other nations' military using space to our disadvantage. Uh, I'm not concerned about the military industrial complex becoming uh, uh, overly aggressive because of uh, activities in space. Not at all. The military is in space now with reconnaissance that gives us information, great information about. Uh, the capabilities of other nations. And we need to improve that. We need to uh, improve our ability to protect our satellites, our assets. We need to put more uh, detection devices that, that can uh, act to discover when aggressive launches occur so that we can react to that appropriately. When all is said and done, how does Buzz Aldrin want to be remembered? When I was young, I remember my father and early, early pioneers talking about the good old days. And somehow it seemed a little sad that they were always looking backward. Maybe that or something else, a spark of creativity, a desire to want to do things better. Uh, I believe that in the last 30 years, at least the last 20, and especially the last 10 or 5, I have developed a, a, a greater appreciation for what I think is the evolutionary direction that I think our nation should go. We can improve on that uh, as we go along, but we need to make some progressive commitments. And I think those commitments need to be somehow in sync with the uh, term of office of the Commander-in-Chief. It's the President who decides the direction uh, of the nation's uh, efforts in space. And those potentially change every four years or at least go through a review and a recommitment. So I think we need successive four-year programs, maybe five or six of them. And uh, the further they are in the future, the more uncertain they are. But the, the ones that you commit yourself to right now are very definite. And then you revise those as you go along. And uh, I would like to be known as a person who introduces visionary, evolutionary concepts to improve uh, our nation and our wor the world's space travel opportunities. Well, Dr. Aldrin, I, th I think everybody would agree that you certainly are that, that person. Thank you very much, sir. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you.